Next on our agenda is an overview of different types of dependent processes. Now, why are we interested in these dependent processes? Well, we saw that these cross terms over here in the last video would need to vanish asymptotically in order for our weak law of large numbers to go through. This limits, of course, the dependency that is allowed in our sequence. In general, the law of large numbers and central limit theorem require finite moments and indeed some form of decaying dependency. Now we will have a closer look at stochastic processes with four types of dependency as listed over here on the slide. The linear processes will be by far the most important ones for our course, since we will mostly make use of these in our derivations. Now law of large numbers and central limit theorems do exist for all of them under suitable conditions, so that's why I would like to give you at least a brief overview of all of them. So let's start with the first one, n-dependence. A strictly stationary sequence of random variables is n-dependent when observations are independent if they are separated in time by more than n time points. So in essence, and dependence is the natural generalization of independence. And we've actually seen an example already of an independent process, namely the MAQ process, where yt or xt here is regressed on its um, previous Q error terms. During the first lecture week, we've seen that only the First, Q autocovariances are different from zero. Afterwards, the autocovariances are all equal to zero. And so an MAQ process is a Q dependent process. Now, the second class of dependent processes that we will look into are so called linear processes which are generalizations of the MAQ processes by letting Q go to infinity. So if we can express XT as an infinite sum of past errors epsilon, it is said to be a linear process. And we will often make use of uh, this notation over here in lag polynomial form where we regroup the constants and the lag operator. Remember, a lag operator L operates on a time series and returns a lagged version of it. So the lag operator to the power J applied to the error process epsilon P gives back the error process at time point T minus J indeed. Now we will define this infinite sum over here as the lag polynomial CL. And in order for this in infinite sum to be properly defined, or in other words, this infinite sequence generates a well-behaved weakly stationary process if these two conditions are satisfied. First, a sequence Pj satisfies, um, that satisfies this condition over here is said to be absolutely summable. Second, we also need the supremum of the first absolute moment to be bounded. Now, during the next couple of weeks, we will often make use of these linear processes. And when we analyze them, we will make use of a very convenient decomposition the so-called beverage Nelson decomposition of the lag polynomial CL. Remember that the lag polynomial is defined here by this infinite sum. And we will often rewrite this lag polynomial in terms of this difference over here, where C1 
is nothing more than our lag polynomial evaluated at L equal to one, which just simplifies them to this infinite sum of the constant C. The C tilde is a new lag polynomial with different constants uh, C tilde, which can nonetheless be related to the original constant C. Now, before we have a look at the proof of this beverage Nelson decomposition, let us look into how we can actually use this de decomposition in practice, for instance, for the law of large numbers. So let's start from our linear process Xt. And we can rewrite this making use of our lag polynomial Cl. In a second step, let's write down the beverage Nelson decomposition from the previous slide as indicated here in blue. Namely that Cl is equal to this difference over here. And then we just expand the terms. First, we have C1 times the error term, and then likewise for the second term. Now, this new lag polynomial C tilde L applied to my error process epsilon T that I will redefine over here as epsilon tilde T. And then in the next line, I just work out this difference over here, one minus the lag operator, which is nothing more than uh, the difference between the new error epsilon t at this point in time and the difference uh, at the previous point in time. Uh, so I have here one times the new error epsilon t, and then I take the lagged value of the new error epsilon t, which is indeed nothing more than the difference between both. All right. For the law of large numbers, we will then need to look at our average. So the average of the xt's where I plug in the expression for xt that we derived above, the red guy over here. And so after plugging in this expression uh, for xt, we need to work out this sum over here. And let's separate both terms. For the first term, I can take C1 out of the sum, since it doesn't depend on T, to have then C1 times um, 1 over T and the sum of the errors. For the last part over here, this is nothing more than the sum of the differences of the epsilon tildes. And let's write out this sum. So for the first time point t equal to one, we have the difference between epsilon tilde one and epsilon not, epsilon zero. For the second term t equals to two, we have the difference between epsilon tilde two and epsilon tilde one. And that all the way until we finally arrive here at the last difference between epsilon tilde at uh, the last time point capital T and the previous value. Now we can see that actually almost all of these terms cancel out. Now you can scratch out epsilon one with epsilon one over here and then so on. And we're actually only left with this difference, namely the difference between the new error at the last time point capital T and at time point zero. Now in the uh, tutorial, we will see that this second term over here is little op1, and so asymptotically negligible, which means that this whole guy uh, over here converges in probability to the expected value of um, the error term pre-multiplied by C1. And in our case, since um, the error terms have zero expectation, the probability limit is just equal to zero. So why is this beverage Nelson decomposition so useful? 
Well, it is so useful since we established our desired result for the weak law of large numbers of linear process xt, only making use of the results from the IID world, namely making use of the weak law of large numbers for epsilon t, so for the IID case. And that is exactly the power of the beverage Nelson device. And you can do a similar exercise for the central limit theorem. Also there, we get the central limit theorem for linear processes, only making use of the central limit theorem for IID sequences. And in your tutorial assignment, you will have a closer look at all of the steps that are involved in these derivations. Now, before we move on to the next class of dependent processes, I include here the proof of the beverage Nelson decomposition for completeness. And I will walk you through all of the steps that are involved, but you will need to take some extra time to digest the steps. Okay, so let's start from our definition of the lag polynomial CL which is nothing more than the infinite sums of the Cs multiplied by the corresponding powers of the lag operator L. And I write this out here. Now in the next line, I regroup the constants, so the Cs, in terms of a difference between two sums as indicated by these large parentheses over here. So what is C naught? C naught is nothing more than the difference between the entire infinite sum and the infinite sum that starts at one. So this guy over here. Similarly, C one is nothing more than the difference between the infinite sum that starts at one and the infinite sum that starts at two. So this guy over here. And so on for the other terms that are involved. In the next line, I then regroup the terms per infinite sum that is involved. So first, I have the infinite sum that starts at zero. And this one is only involved here in the beginning. So I put that here again. Next, I have the infinite sum that starts at one. And this one is involved here once where it appears with L to the power zero, or that is just equal to one. And it also appears over here with L to the power one. So that one over here. Similarly, I have an infinite sum that starts at two. And that one pops up once in combination with the lag operator L, and once in combination with the lag operator squared. Or equivalently, I can write that down as the product of one minus L times L to the power one, which gives me indeed L and L squared. Now you can check that the other terms are built up in a very similar way. In the next line, I then use simply more compact notation where I introduce here an additional sum that runs over the powers of L. Here I have no L, so that is L to the power zero. And then I have L to the power one, L to the power two and so on. Okay, so then I'm really about to arrive here at the last step. Since this infinite sum of constants is nothing more than the new C's that I defined uh, here, the C tildes I defined earlier on the slide is nothing more 
than uh, this sum over here of the original seat. And I also simplified the first term in the expression. The infinite sum of all the C's is nothing more than just C1. Okay, so I arrived already at this expression. And then the last uh, expression follows from a minor rewriting of the last term by just simply plugging in the definition of the new polynomial C tilde L. And that gives you indeed the desired result that you can write a CL dislike polynomial in terms of this difference. <laughs>